This talk is dedicated to all those people who lost their lives on that unfortunate accident on 14th April 1944. It's an old tribute, especially to those 66 firemen who gave up their lives in the line of duty so that the rest of Bombay could live. I'm going to start this presentation with a small clip from YouTube. Some of you would have seen it, but that clip will put this whole presentation in perspective. Bombay, gateway to India, and Signal Corps films of one of the worst disasters in India's history. A mysterious fire on a Liberty ship carrying munitions. Then a terrific explosion that scatters flame and destruction throughout the harbor area. Seventy men and seven engines of the Bombay Fire Brigade disappeared without trace on the docks. The first of two huge blasts hurled one 4,000-ton ship up on the wharf and rained debris and white-hot steel over Bombay starting fires that destroyed whole sections of the city. Fire through three days and nights makes 50,000 homeless. Bombay's formerly peaceful streets present the appearance of an earthquake. Old rocks are blown flat, and pieces of the ship lie thousands of yards from the dock area. Property damage over $150 million, 1,040 injured, 336 dead. 20 minutes later, another explosion. of miles from any battlefront, Bombay feels the hot and deadly hand of war. You heard the narrator say right in the beginning that this explosion was caused by a mysterious fire. All fires, even mysterious fires, have a very definite cause. Now what caused this fire? Was it an unfortunate accident and therefore an aberration? Or was it because of enemy sabotage action? Because remember, April 1944, the Second World War was very much on. Or then, was it because of another of man's unending follies? To get to the root cause, let me take you back to where it all began. Most Stories of the sea have a ship as its protagonist. And this evening's tale, being a nautical one, is no different. The lead actor of Prima Donna, if you want to call it that way, is the SS Fort Steichen, which you see on the screen. The image is a little pixelated, but I'm afraid this is the only image of the Steichen which is available and the dimensions of the ship. Length in meters and feet, self-explanatory. Beam is actually the width, the, 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 the breadth of the ship, both in meters and feet. Tonnage, for those people who are not familiar with nautical terms, the first figure 7142 is the gross registered tonnage. Now, what do you mean by gross registered tonnage? This is the entire volumetric capacity of the ship, which will include the living spaces, the machinery spaces, and the cargo carrying capacity. Now, from the GRT, if you reduce the machinery spaces and you reduce the uh, living spaces, what you get is the cargo carrying capacity, which is normally ex expressed as net registered tonnage. And for mercantile money, the net registered tonnage is the, car, is the earning capacity of the ship. Now, if you go to this the image, the central structure which you see is a bridge superstructure. 
Now the bridge of a ship is very similar to the cockpit of an aircraft. At sea, the ship is controlled from there. And if you go forward, I want you to see at these five points which I'm showing. One, two, this one between the two structures, three, four, and five. Now, these are cargo holds. Now, what is a hold? A hold is nothing but an enclosed space in which you store cargo. You will hear this term again and again. I'll explain in detail what a cargo hold is later on, but I thought I'll clarify what this cargo hold is. The draft of the ship, 27 feet, 8.2 meters. Now the draft of the ship is the that part of the ship which is below the water line. So from the water line to the keel, that is the draft of the ship. And it's a direct function of how you load the ship. Greater the load, deeper will be the draft and vice versa. Propulsion, she was a steam propelled ship, but you made steam by burning coal. The average speed, 10 knots, you could do a maximum of about 11 knots. Now, register, every ship has to be registered, which is very similar to registering your motor car with the RTO. Now, this fig, uh, figure which you see means the ship was surveyed twice. Now, more, generally ships are surveyed only once after she's constructed, but in the case of Steichen, she was surveyed twice, one during the construction and one after the construction, and it was registered in London under Lloyd's Register, which is the leading registration agency of ships. The figure 100A means she met all specifications mentioned by Lloyd, and the figure 1 is the state of her anchors and cables. In short, after construction, she was a first class ship. Registered in the port of London. Now, the Stikeen was built in a Canadian shipyard for the Americans, completed in July 1942, within a year of commencement of construction. She was handed over to Britain by America under President Roosevelt's Lend Lease Act. So, in short, owned by the Americans, built by Canadians and operated by the British. It doesn't get more Caucasian than that. Between July 1942 and February 1944, the Stikeen made four voyages between European ports and ports in Europe and United States carrying war material. And at the end of January 1944, she was at Birkenhead, which is a port on the west coast of England. Now, this is Birkenhead here yeah, on the Irish Sea, and this is a blown up area, a blown up map of the area. This is the River Mercy as she enters into the Irish Sea, and there are a whole lot of ports on the River Mercy, both on the northern bank and the southern bank, but the two most important ports are Birkenhead and Liverpool. Birkenhead and Liverpool also have a unique record in the sense that the first underwater rail tunnel between two ports or two places on an estuary was constructed in 1886 between Birkenhead and Liverpool. The regulations for the port of Bombay are basically based on the regulations existing for the port of Birkenhead. Between Birkenhead and Liverpool, Liverpool is a more important port. But people of a certain generation might remember Liverpool for something different. It gave the world of music the original fact for the Beatles. This is the modern image of Birkenhead. Nothing much has changed since 1944, except for a couple of more structures coming up. And now, 
at Birkenhead, Cyclean was loading for a fifth and what would turn out to be a final voyage. This is the top view. If you look from top, this is how a hole will look like. And these are the sliding hatches which will close it once you are at sea. On top, this is the side view of a cargo hole. For the minute, forget this part because that is where the bilges are. All the flush from the all the slush from the engine is accumulated here and thrown out. But this is what a hole is. And normally holes are in two parts: the upper part and the lower part. And there's a deck which runs through, separating the upper part of the hole and the lower part of the hole. This is not the stikeen because there are no images of the stikeen left. This is a standard bulk carrier. And once a bulk carrier is loaded, this is how she looks from top. This is the hold. This is, of course, a bulk carrier carrying coal. But this is how they look. Filled up to the top. These hatches can, will slide and close it so that it makes the hold watertight. So there's no ingress of water when you're at sea. Now, at Birkenhead, what was she loading? She was embarking both dangerous and glamorous cargo for Karachi and Bombay. Now, what was the dangerous cargo? For Karachi, she was loading gliders, which were in CK deck, CK deck condition and strewn around the upper deck. And 12 Spitfires, again in CK deck condition, was distributed over five holes. And in these holes, Surrounding these crates were explosives and ammunition. Now, this is what a typical glider will look like, not very different from what was existing then. This was being taken to Karachi to be, to be used in the Burma front. This, of course, is the iconic Spitfire. Well, Spitfires in CKD condition in boxes distributed over five poles. And this again is ammunition, ammunition packed in boxes and spread again in five holes surrounding these crates. And what was she loading for Bombay? 1,325 tons of explosives. The various kinds of explosives are shown on the slide, distributed from hole number one to hole number four. Interestingly, in number two hole, she was carrying 31 crates containing gold. Each, each crate contained four bars. So that would make it a total of 124 gold bars. Each bar weighed about 28 pounds, uh, which, is, which is about 12.7 kilos. The total weight of the total gold carried on board was a little more than one and a half. Uh, one and a half tons. Now, what was this gold being carried for? This gold was purchased by England at a little over 17 shillings a pound, which actually would work out to about 40,473 pounds. And this was being shipped to India as repayment, part repayment of Britain's wartime debt to India. But it was all, all that simple. When it was being shipped to India, it was valued at 320 shillings an ounce, which worked out to about 7 lakh 40,000 pounds. Sorry, 7, sorry, 7 lakh 40,000 pounds. So you buy it at 40,000 pounds, you ship it to India as part payment of the wartime debt and valued at 7 lakh 40,000 pounds. It was financial jugglery at its devious best. At Birkenhead, when this cargo was being loaded, remember World War II was on, so the movement of the ship should not be known to too many people. So it was known to certain port officials. The ship's crew, of course, had to know about it. 
And surprisingly, anybody or anyone on the team who cared to keep his eyes open would see these huge crates marked Bombay and Karachi being loaded onto the ship. So much for wartime security. Now, in wartime, merchant ships never sailed alone. They had to go in a convoy. Now, this is what a typical convoy would look. You know, about 50 to 60 merchant ships were grouped together and they were escorted by warships, especially in European waters, in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And this was basically air threat and anti-submarine threat was very, very real. And merchant ships, even if they were armed, were very likely armed for self-defense against aircraft. They had absolutely no protection against submarines. So it was a norm that merchant ships would be grouped together, escorted by warships, and then would proceed out of port. Same with uh, Stikey. On 24th of February, she departed Birkenhead. From here, it was a convoy of 50 ships down into the English Channel into the Atlantic, right up to Gibraltar. At Gibraltar, the convoy split. The major part of the convoy went south along the west coast of Africa, and about 12 ships continued into the Mediterranean. And this convoy, which went into the Mediterranean, was met by another convoy which came from the US so both these convoys joined together and the regrouped convoy went past Gibraltar into the Mediterranean. Of Algiers, it came under a German air raid. There were four German bombers who were actually heading for Algiers. When they found this convoy, they found it as an opportunity target and attacked it. Uh, surprisingly, no damage to the convoy. All these four aircraft were shot down by ships escorting this convoy. So no, no damage or no loss of ships. Off Sicily, again, 11th March, the convoy split again. The major part went into the Aegean and 12 ships into the Red Sea. Stiapin was part of this convoy which went into the Red Sea. At the northern end of Port, uh, Su uh, the Suez Canal is a port of Eek, and all ships in those days, at least especially coal carrying ships, would stop at Topik to bunker. Now, bunkering is a term which came into nautical use with coal fired ships. They would take in coal. Today, bunkering means not only taking fuel or coal, but also metals. So, they made a stop on 23rd March at, uh, at Port of Eek for bunkering, and after two days, went down the Suez Canal, past the Suez Canal into Aden. Again, she stopped for bunkering, again took in uh, coal, and then on 27th of March, departed for Karachi, to arrive at Karachi on 30th April. This is the modern port of Karachi. Arrived at Karachi at 3 p.m. on 30th March. Now, between 30th March and 3rd April, all the stores which were earmarked for Karachi were disembarked, which would mean the gliders, the Spitfire aircrafts, and some ammunition. And after these were disembarked, it created a huge cavernous space of 2,80,000 cubic feet. You want to convert cubic feet into tons, you divide it by 1,000. Sorry, you divide by 100, you get 2,860 tons. Now, there were certain regulations existing for loading cargo by Joseph Lenning. Uh, sorry, Lenning, which was published in 1942, as well as Ministry of Transport, which amended regulations which are in force. Now, I'm going to summarize 
these regulations with respect to cargo which was loaded at Karachi. Cotton, you could load cotton. There was no, issue, there was no restriction loading cargo, but it could never be in proximity to oil or grease because cotton is uh, spontaneously combustible. There was an erroneous also combustible, but that myth was broken. Aircraft dope, aircraft dope is in fact gun which had fabric. You know, it was, it was used as lacquer for uh, those aircrafts to stretch the uh, uh, fabric and to make it watertight. Commercially, it's called gun cotton. It, all the cargo that was embarked on striking, this was the most dangerous and inflammable. About 20 tons were embarked. We'll come to that later. Timber, standard precautions, you avoid placing it in the same hold as explosives. Scrap iron, the same restriction. You should not place it in holes which have explosives. Sulfur, don't place it in holes where edible cargo is kept for various obvious reasons. Gold, there were actually no restrictions on carrying gold except that you had to give it adequate security cover to prevent any pilferage. This is, I mean, dry fish, fish manure, rice and raisin, no real restrictions except that when you load it, you must keep the ship's stability in mind. Load it in such a way that the ship is on an even keel and it's not, it doesn't have any, it is not tilting or it, it doesn't have a disc to any side. Very normal restrictions. Now, those are the restrictions. Let's see what was loaded at Karachi. Cotton, 1400 tons of cotton in 8,700 bales distributed over four holes, number one, number two, number four, number five. So far, so good. Lubricating oil, 10,976 trumps in four holes. Remember, the regulation was if you carry cotton and if you carry lubricating oil, in the same hole, you cannot have more than 250 drums of lube oil in the same hole. This rule was broken in every hole. Explosives, nearly 1,400 tons in four holes. So if you look at it, number one hole, you had cotton, you had lubricating oil, you had explosives. That was the case in most cases. That was the case uh, most of the cargo loaded. Sulfur, number one hold, 9,000 bags, 325 tons. Timber, 27,000 pieces of timber in one, two, and five, which also had cotton, also had low oil, also had explosives. Aircraft dope, which I told you the most inflammable item carried, 20 tons in number three hold, which also had explosives, which also had lubricating oil. Gold bars, in number two hold, really no restrictions, it was okay. You could carry gold in whichever hole you wanted. Scrap iron, this, this is a minor miscellaneous item which were spread over four holes, about 100 tons. They have grouped them together because they were really not hazardous cargo. So you take an overview of this. Every rule book was flouted. So was the captain of the ship, an imbecile who had no clue. No, it wasn't that. Remember, World War was on and all, all safety norms were waved off, especially in terms of cotton. Cotton was a very important product, but Karachi had no cotton mills. All cotton mills were in Bombay, but the hinterland of Karachi grew most of the cotton. The British were paranoid that cotton would be sold in the black market. So they had stopped transportation of cotton by road or rail from Karachi to Bombay. And the regulation was all cotton which moved from Karachi had to come in ships to Bombay. The captain of the ship 
did protest but was overruled by the ministry of defense representative who was in karachi because these were being carried for eventual use in burma so you see british india or independent india bombay's problems always began at karachi she departed karachi on 9th of april an uneventful passage to bombay where she arrived on 12th april anchored off victoria dock except somewhere off gujarat the fish and fish manure which was being carried in number one hold turned rancid and it gave an awful smell this is the modern port of bombay i'm going to spend some time on this if you disregard this little on uh, bay here which is a naval dockyard the entire port complex on the eastern seaboard of bombay came up because of a folly of the government what that folly was what were its repercussions and how the then government and par government and par overcame that or of course outside the purview of this talk but i hope some day this talk is held and this tale told to the khaki audience because it is this maritime infrastructure which came up on the eastern seaboard of bombay which was primarily responsible for the city of bombay proudly wearing on its escutcheon its proudest title urbs primus in india which translates to premier city of india for this lecture suffice to say this entire structure came up in the later half of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century with sasoom dock here coming up in 1875 the princess dock coming up in 1880 the victoria dock in 1888 and the alexandra dock in 1914 the popular misconception is that sasun when the sasun dock came up in 1875 it was the first commercial wet dock in bombay now when i say a wet dock it means a modern port with wharfage warehouses customs all other paraphernalia which go to make a modern port uh, most people believe that the sasun dock was the first first wet dock in bombay i am afraid that belief is incorrect it by at least 175 years and it's incorrect because of this what you see here is a view of the bombay dockyard which is now called the naval dockyard this image which you see here the bay no was called the bandar the first bandar of bombay this jetty which you see extending here was called the pier the first pier which came up in bombay in 18 sorry 1693 this structure uh, you see was a company house of the east india house and he, Here were all the warehouses and the godowns. The Bombay Dock, which came up in 1750, is here. Now there was a problem with this jetty. This was where the water came uh, ended when it was low tide. When it was high tide, the water came right up to here. What we call the high water line and the low water line, which means this. jetty which came up in 1693 could not be used 24/7 because there was no water here the next image you see of the bandar is 1803 you see this 
jetty has been extended right up to here there's a breakwater which comes up and this is a full fledged bunger unfortunately this is not uh, uh, most people in bombay have not seen it because it's part of the naval dockyard but naval officers have seen this and this pier which is jutting out which came up in 1803 is still in use for the same purpose it was built this bandar was the first commercial wet dock in bombay and not sasun dock and interestingly if this dock was being held in april it would be held in the bandar room of khaki of khaki and that bandar room is named after this bandar enough of bombay let's go back to things more mechanical now this is the port of bombay with its three which is uh, three famous wet docks princess dock victoria dock unfortunately filled up now and this is the alexander dock and this is cross island so when stikin entered bombay she anchored off cross island because that was the standard place where ships anchored waiting for the examination officer and the embarkation officer to embark now handling explosives in peace time before world war 1 so i beg your pardon before world war 2 no explosives could be handled inside the wet docks second under rule 46 for the regulations of the port of bombay every ship carrying hazardous cargo had to fly this red flag which was an indication for other ships that this particular ship is carrying hazardous or dangerous cargo and those in the vicinity have to exercise caution this uh, under rule 104 ammunition could not be disembarked in the wet docks it has to be it had to be disembarked at anchorage and once it was taken in lighters and taken into the wet docks it could not be stored in the port first it had to leave immediately now what is a lighter now this is a ship secured to a boy could also be at anchorage these are lighters so prior to 1939 if any ship carrying ammunition came to bombay she had to anchor and the hazardous cargo had to be disembarked into lighters and these lighters would proceed to the wet docks it could not be stored in wet docks it had to be taken out of the port first but with the commencement of world war 2 this rule was amended what was the amendment under the defense of india rules rule number 88 ships need not fly flag proud well, there's a very valid reason for this the minute you flew this flag it was an open invitation for enemy aircraft and saboteurs to make the ship a target is as good as saying our oh, bell mujhe maar and for that reason flag Flying of black uh, flag bravo on ships was discontinued. As far as ammunition was concerned, on certificate of agency by embarkation headquarters. Now every major port in in India had an embarkation headquarters team, which was an inter-service organization, and it controlled or coordinated between the port trusts. and the armed forces all military stores which came into the port if a certificate of agents or urgency was given by the embarkation headquarters representative then explosives uh, ships carrying explosives could come into the dock and disembark ammunition but there were restrictions category a explosives category a explosives are those which are highly volatile and explode on detonation 
These could be disembarked in lighters within the wet dock area, but could not be stored. It had to be taken out of the docks immediately. Category B ammunition, which, which, uh, which exploded by combustion and relatively safer than category A, could be directly disembarked into railway wagons on the jetty, but could not be stored in the docks. It had to move, it had to be moved from the docks immediately. Category C explosives were worked with a combination of category A and category B, but relatively safer. It could be disembarked into wagons and stored in the docks. The Port Trust objected to this waiver of rules and they were very concerned about the ammunition be, de, being disembarked in within the dock complex and rightly so. So to mollify the Port Trust, they were indemnized for any accident which took place within the port complex by handling explosives as long as that accident was not due to negligence. So when Steichen entered Bombay Harbor and anchored off the Victoria dock, the embarkation headquarters representative came, gave this certificate of agency because of which she could enter the Victoria dock. Now in this long history of Bombay, Ships, ammunition, fire, explosions, and senseless death have all been a, have all played a role. And on that fateful forenoon of 12th April, in Steichen, with a deadly mix of cargo, entered Victoria Dock and took up a pre-assigned berth. The stage was set for a devastating encore. When the ship came alongside at uh, Victoria Dock, there was a Bombay Auxiliary Fire Service crew at the berth, which was mandatory. All ships carrying ammunition, would all, uh, the jetty would be manned by the Bombay Auxiliary Fire Service crew. Now, what was the Bombay Auxiliary Fire Service crew? Before the Japanese entered the World War, World War II in 1939, the British government had decreed that all major ports and all major cities would set up something called Air Raid Precaution Unit, which is very similar to what the civil defense organization in cities are today. It had three parts. It had the auxiliary fire service. It had the ambulance services. It also had the salvage services. In about 1942, when it was known that Bombay didn't have didn't, didn't face that kind of a uh, threat from uh, air raids. The British government decreed that Bombay would be placed in a white area and to reduce the expenditure, they had uh, told the Bombay government to disband the air raid precaution unit. But the Bombay government didn't listen to it. They were quite, they were quite okay with uh, disbanding the ambulance service and the salvage services, but they insisted on the Bombay Auxiliary Service being retained to supplement the, the uh, firefighting capabilities of the Bombay Fire Brigade. In retrospect, this was a big plus point because the Bombay Auxiliary Fire Service played a stellar role in the Bombay Dock explosion. There's a lesson for all Bombay Wallers in this. If you are a Bombay Wala, you did not listen to everything what Delhi tells you to do. When the ship came alongside, Mr. Desai, who was the foreman of stevedores of Mrs. Click Nixon, who handled offloading of cargo for ships, which was owned by the company which owns Taikin, came on board, met the chief officer, and he had no clue that ship was carrying ammunition. He didn't have, he had the uh, cargo manifest, but nobody told him that ammunition was being carried on the stake 
which meant that he had not catered for disembarkation of the ammunition and did not requisition lights. Striking came alongside about 12 o'clock on 12th April and the first set of lighters to disembark ammunition was placed on the ship only 24 hours later. So much for the certificate of urgency. The ship's crew were very keen that the gold which was, uh, which was uh, consigned to the Reserve Bank of India as uh, part payment of uh, Britain's wartime debt to India was disembarked and handed over to the Reserve Bank of India. But the bank did not accept the gold because they wanted this, the, the, this 30, 31 crates of gold were kept in a safe which was welded to the, welded to the bulkhead of the ship and it was surrounded by explosives. Now to remove the safe, you had to do welding and the ship staff were very, very, very firm that no welding would take place as long as the ammunition was not disembarked. The Reserve Bank of India representatives refused to take the gold and they would rule that decision. Uh, I remember I told you about the fish menace, it was creating an unbearable stench. Now, as long as the ship was at sea, there was no issue because uh, you know, the, the, the cross ventilation and the sea breeze coming in reduced that stench. But once inside the confined space of the box, it became unbearable. And since both gold and ammunition were not taken off, the ship crew re requested uh, Mr. Desai to remove the fish from Namabhavan Gold. 13th morning, an ordinance, an, an ordinance office representative visited the ship and briefed Mr. Desai on disembarkation of ammunition. Now, this, there was an ordnance team which was attached to the port trust, and the ordnance officer was over was the overall in charge of handling explosives. The ship came alongside on 12th. The representative from the ordnance office came on board only after 24 hours to brief Mr. Desai on disembarking, disembarking ammunition. So much for certificate of urgency. 14th morning, forenoon of 14th morning, The main engines of the Stikeen had developed some defect because the intermediate stage valve had got defective. This was a common problem with all uh, this was a common problem with all uh, ships of the fourth class, and the uh, intermediate stage valve had to be removed because of which the main engine had to be opened up. Effectively, it meant if the Stikeen had to move out under her own power, she would have to, uh, she could not move because the main engines were opened up for repairs. By 12.30 hours on 14th April, 1,400 tons of cargo was disembarked and this included fish and fish manure, timber and the other miscellaneous items including 400 tons of explosives. You had 1,300 95 tons of explosives, you disembarked 400, you still had about 1,000 tons of explosives on board. 48 hours after, Stikeen had secured alongside. Now, this is the layout of the Princess and Victoria Dock. This is Victoria Dock. 14 ships here. This is Princess Dock, 12 ships, a total of 26 ships in Victoria and Princess Dock. This was the Stikey. You know, she was secured with her port side to the jetty, which means the left side of the ship was touching the jetty. This distance was about 400 yards. I want you to look, have a look at this ship. This was the Fort Trevier, which was a sister ship of uh, Stikey. 
and this was SS Iran, which was a stern of uh, Portugal. Twelve thirty to one thirty was the lunch break. All the stevedores left the ship, and there was inadequate watchkeeping on stacking. There were not enough people to supervise or a security people to know what was happening on the stacking. Because everybody left for lunch. At about twelve thirty, an officer from Fort Trevia came up after lunch to have. To, to to have a smoke, and at that time he saw smoke coming out from uh, Stikey. Now she was not flying flag Bravo, so they had no idea that what was the problem. He and he had no clue what was a cargo being carried on Stikey. Similarly, two gentlemen who were there on SS Iran came up, saw this. Smoke coming. They saw this uh, uh, smoke coming up, and they thought if it's being, uh, if they have seen it, even people on Stikeen would have seen it. But nobody was around on Stikeen to see it. Mr. Critchell, who was the senior inspector of the Bombay Police, he was the uh, he was at the Green Gate here. Green Gate was somewhere here, and he was on duty here. He also saw smoke coming out. But ignored it because he didn't know what was the cargo being carried on Stikey. Effectively, the first indications of a fire and board generally went it was generally ignored. Now, 1345 when 1330 when everybody came back on board and they started disembarking cargo. This was the state of cargo on Stikey. These are the holes. You may not be able to see the lettering, but go as for the color code. Red is for ammunition. Green is for cotton. These are the miscellaneous items. I want you to look concentrate on number two hole and number four hole. It had ammunition. This was the gold which was kept in the safe. You had timber and scrap iron here. You had cotton and you had ammunition. Number four hole. It contained twice the ammunition on board. Or uh, what? What was there in number two? This was what was what this was the situation at 145. The first indication of something was wrong came at about 1345 when the steward, those who were disembarking stores, saw smoke coming out of number two hole. The minute they saw, saw smoke coming out, it was a indication of their job was not to do firefighting. They all abandoned the hole, came up on the upper deck, and started running out of the ship. The auxiliary fire service team, which was along, which is on the jetty, saw this stampede at the gangway and realized that there was something wrong. And when they saw, this is the first time they, they saw smoke coming out of the uh, uh, of the hole, and they realized the ship was on fire. <laughs> The section leader of uh, the uh, of the AFS, the auxiliary fire system, came came on board, laid out the uh, hoses, and he told the assistant leader to go and uh, make a telephone call to the Victoria Dock Fire Station and say that and to pass the number two message. The number two message was it meant it was a code which was prevalent in the port trust. It said that a ship. Carrying ammunition was on fire. The assistant sub leader went into the shed, which was next to the jetty, looked for a telephone, saw a telephone, picked it up, but he didn't hear any dial tone. And he thought the uh, telephone was dead. Actually, it was his old telephone that you pick up the telephone, wait for about 10 seconds, then the operator comes on the line. But in that panic, he forgot what he had been told and then thought the telephone is not working, kept it back and ran to the, ran onto the jetty. He saw a fire alarm. You know, you had this on the jetty, you had this enclosed in glass spaces, fire alarms. He smashed it open and pressed that alarm. What it meant then was there was a general fire in the, in, in the Victoria dock. It didn't necessarily mean that there 
was a major fire. If he had passed the number two message, the the dock the dock fire station would have rear, would have come to know that this is a major fire on an ammunition laden ship. But because he just smashed the fire alarm system and rang that alarm, it was taken as a general fire. The standard procedure was that when the minute you have a normal fire, two fire engines or fire tenders, as the term is, arrived at the jetty and started their firefighting operation. It's when the fire tenders came on board and the section in charge of the fire tenders realized that this is that this this is an ammunition laden ship that they passed the number two message. The number two message, when it was passed to the Victoria Dock Fire Station, people realized the gravity of the situation. The ship staff made their own attempts uh, with the help of the auxiliary fire service system to fight the fire. They knew the fire was in the number two hole, but they didn't know where the, the seat of the fire was. Now, unless you know where the seat of the fire was, all effort to fight would be infectious. The reason why they didn't know was they went down into the hole, but they, they had smoke masks, but they didn't have, they, they didn't have fire suits. The heat in the number two hole did not allow them to stay for too long. So without knowing where the seat of the fire was, they were pumping water into number two hole. With the two fire tenders coming in and the firefighting uh, facilities of the ship, 11 hoses were pouring water into the number two hole without knowing where the fire was. After the number two message was passed, Captain B.T. Opers came on board and he was the ordnance officer of, uh, of the, uh, who was a deputation to the port trust. Remember, it was his representative who had come on board one day earlier to guide Mr. Desai the procedure for disembarking ammunition. But when he came on board, this is what he told the ship staff. Now, if you discount the grandstanding, if any person had to know about explosives being carried on the ship, it would have to be the explosive handling officer. And his staff had come on board, seen the plan, but when he came on board, this is what he had to say. It was just simple, plain, simple grandstanding. When the number two message was passed, all the big wigs, the who's who of Bombay Port Trust, came on to birth number one. And they were discussing what action is to be taken. The, the, the people who came on board, everybody, the names are there. Captain Obers was there, Captain Longmire, who was the chief salvage officer of the Royal, Navy, Royal Indian Navy. Norman Coombs, who was the chief firefighting officer of the Bombay Fire Brigade. Colonel Sadler, General Manager BPT, Arthur Reynolds, Fire Officer BPT, Nicholson, Dockmaster, and Mr. C.T. Wilson. These gentlemen assembled on the jetty and they were discussing. What were they discussing? Somebody said Stikin had to move out under her own power. That was not possible because the main engines were opened up and she could not do it. Towed out. It was possible to tow out, uh, tow Stikin out of Victoria Dock, but that would mean requisitioning tugs and there were a lot of movement of ships in the Victoria Dock and no tugs would be available for another hour. So that was out. Somebody suggested scuttling of the ship. Now scuttling of the ship is when you deliberately sink the ship. You open valves which are near the water line and allow water to come into, uh, allow water to be ingressed into the ship. But no valve on Stikine would do that because they were non-return valves. They could allow the bilges or such to go out from the stikine, but they didn't, they opened only in one direction, which means they could not, even if they opened it, no water would come into the, uh, into the stikine. And what 
these gen and none of these gentlemen who were present there had the authority to order the scuttling of a ship. That authority lay in the commodore in charge of the navy, and he would know of this explosion only with the rest of Bombay. Between 1500 and 1515, you know, the ship's crew decided that this uh, 25 detonators, which were highly explosive in number, number one hole, had to be removed. They could, they could not go into number two hole because of the smoke and the heat. But the best thing they did was to remove these detonators from number one hole. It didn't help matters. Additional fire tenders were reported to Victoria Dock after the number two message was passed. There were a total of 13 fire tenders, and at one time, 32 hoses poured nearly 900 tons of water into number two hole without knowing the seat of fire. With so much of water going into the stacking, she started listing critically to starboard. This is when the ship is not on an even keel. I'll show you an image what a list is, and to keep the ship stable, additional lines were passed on the ship to show to keep her secure. Now, this is a list. You know, when there's so much of water going into the stacking that, you know, it all, all went to the starboard side and it started tilting. This actually was a blessing in disguise for the stacking because this would give an indication of where the seat of fire was. This is the number two hold of the ship. This is the starboard side, this is the port side, and there was a tilt. So this portion had come up and this had come down. This area in number two hold, outside of the ship, on the hull of the ship, they saw the firemen who were on the jetty and fighting the fire saw flaking. And this was an indication that the seat of the fire was here. It became very simple that if they had the, since this was on the, this was the port side and the ship had tilted, if they could rig up some staging and have a gas cutting machine to cut a hole, to cut a hole in the ship side, they could directly access the seat of fire. But when the gas, the gas cutting equipment was set up and they wanted to cut it, the equipment was defective and they could not cut the, uh, uh, the, uh, they, they could not drill a hole into the hull of the ship. Replacement for the gas cutting machine was ordered from Mazagon Docks Limited and from this firm, Messrs. Alloc Ashdown and Company, which provided equipment to the Bombay Fire Brigade. The one from the company never reached, and the one ordered from Mazagon Dock. Time to imperfection came with the first explosion. No, even though they indicated that they, they had determined the seat of the fire, they could not directly attack the seat of fire. Time was running out for the stanky. The upper deck started heating up. And this is where the firemen played a tremendous role. Because of the upper deck heating up because of the intense heat, you know, the water which came on to the deck of the ship was actually boiling water. They still did not leave the stations. They continued fighting the fire. <clears throat> now, normally water is an antidote to fire. But in this case, Water was actually helping the fire. It happened this way. Because of the list, the ship had tilted this way. This was up, and they were pouring water into the number two hole. Because of the list, the water started trickling to the starboard side. And it started, these were there were, there were cotton bales here. It started pushing the cotton bales down. When the cotton bales were pushed down, 
this part started coming up because they were tightly packed cotton bales. And the seat and this seat of fire started coming, rising vertically towards this place where ammunition was kept. And as it started coming up, the ammunition caught fire and black smoke started coming out of the foaming. And along with that, burning pieces of cotton started coming out from the hatch. From here, cotton started coming out. Between 1550 and 1600, after the ammunition had caught fire, a huge flame, huge flame started shooting up from the hatch. When he saw the flames coming out, the captain of the ship ordered the ship to be abandoned. As happens in India, when this firefighting was going on, the, most of the workers of the port trust had gathered, gathered on the jetty to see what was happening on the ship. As the burning cotton started coming out, it fell on the shed, which was on the jetty, and the shed start and the shed caught fire. After giving the order to abandon ship, Captain Naismith, in, in, in good marine tradition, walked on the ship to see that every, everybody had left the ship. And when he was taking rounds of the ship, he saw that number four hole, which contained twice the ammunition of number two hole, the hatch was kept open in the hurry and all the excitement to, 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 to continue the firefighting and number two hole, they had forgotten about the number two hole. So even as he left the ship, he realized the number four hatch was open. That was the last straw on the camel's back. <coughs> he left the ship and as, as, as he was walking backward, uh, walking uh, walking away from the ship. When he came abreast of the stern of the ship, the time was four, six minutes past four o'clock. And that is when the stikine exploded. The first explosion, the forward part of the ship sheared off and skidded about 30 yards and sank. The rear part of the ship remained stubbornly buoyant and kept floating. From the number two hole, burning cotton hot metals were thrown, which were thrown up, fell into the number four hole to the open hatch. Remember the number four hole had more explosives than the number two hole. The second explosion took place at 440, which was more, ma which was massive than the first explosion. The first explosion was lateral in the sense the damage was confined to the within the port complex. The second explosion, you know, the, the entire the ammunition and the cotton bales and the metal, things, me, uh, metal scrap which was there in number four was thrown up into the air about 3,000 feet into the air and was distributed. And as it came on, it was distributed over 1,000 yards from Victoria Dock. And this caused most of the explosion, outside, most of the damage outside the port first. This is, this is the Stikine here, when she, went, uh, when she went up, Princess Dock, Victoria Dock, Alexandra Dock. The damage was in five areas. This was the waterfront. There were a lot of native crops here. Most of them were sunk because, the, because burning cotton and some explosives landed on them. Victoria Dock was completely damaged, Princess Dock partially damaged, and north of Victoria Dock, this is where Bharat Petro uh, I beg your pardon, Burma Shell had its petroleum. Fortunately, nothing fell here because if that had, if any debris had, burning debris had fallen there and you had the uh, oil dumps of Bharat, uh, Burma Shell, you could imagine what would have happened. Alexander Rock, fortunately, not too much of damage. 
most of the damage was in this area. This is PDML road or Frey road, and this is the area where all the go-downs and warehouses were kept. And they caught fire, and collateral damage was uh, was uh, happened lot be, uh, beyond this area. Nine, it was 900 yards was the area, but collateral damage happened beyond this area too. This is what this is what happened within the dock. All ships in this was before the explosion. This was after the explosion. Similarly, in Princess Dock, this was the state after the explosion. All ships came out of their moorings. Some of them sank, sank alongside. Some of them they got very heavy damage. The most strange case was the ship behind Victoria Dock. Yes, SS Jalapad Mahashi was thrown about 60 feet in the air and as she came down, this is how she, she came to rest across, uh, above the jetty. Part of it into the water, part of it on the jetty. I'm going to show you some images of what happened outside and within the uh, port first. This is the aerial view of ground zero. The damage in Victoria Dock, and this is the Jalapadma, which I said, which was thrown up 60 feet into the air and came crashing down onto the jetty. Victoria Dock. Another view. Some of these images are disturbing, but I thought I must show this image to know, to tell you what happened within the dock. This, this is in St. Xavier School and part propeller of a ship landed in the school which has been now put up as an artifact. This is from the Time Life, uh, of the Time Magazine of 22nd April where they showed this image. The gold bars, this is representative only. The Bombay Chronicle of 22nd April said all gold bars were recovered. I think you have to take this with a pinch of salt. The damage was so extensive that on 20th May, one, one month after the uh, explosion, Mahatma Gandhi had to visit the Port Trust to see for himself the damage that was caused. Because of wartime, there was a complete clampdown clamp down on the media. And though people knew what had happened, nothing was reported in the press till Time magazine of 22nd May produced this. And this, this was the first indication of the magnitude of destruction. An inquiry commission was held, set up by the government of uh, India. And the following were the members of the inquiry commission. Leonard Stone, who was the then Chief Justice of Bombay, incidentally, the last English Chief Justice of Bombay. Justice Dhavle, who was the Kusain judge. Kusain judge is the judge senior most uh, after the Chief Justice. Rear Admiral Holland and Captain Bayford were the naval representatives who were in this uh, committee. They examined 250, 59 witnesses which were sworn to, sworn to secrecy. You know, and they were the Enquiry Commission sat in the High Court. The report was in two parts. Part one action taken before and during the disaster and the causes. Part two actions after the first explosion and damage suffered by the city. The findings actually summing up of what actually happened there, incorrect storage of Karachi, known. Delay in disembarking explosives alongside, remember, despite the certificate of urgency, no ammunition was disembarked 24 hours after cycling and secure launching. Nobody actually knew what ignited the cotton because there was nothing left of the striking to do any forensic, uh, forensic investigation. 
circumstantial evidence said it could be accidental ignition of comet. At no stage were those in charge of firefighting or taking or to, or to circumvent the damage exactly realize the gravity of the situation. At the outset and duration of the fire, at every stage, they never realized the, uh, what was the gravity of the fire because they kept, first of all, they didn't know where the seat of fire was. They were just kept pumping water into it without knowing it. I've explained this. There was no, uh, till the second explosion happened, nobody realized the gravity of the situation. And no action was taken to avert disaster. With all those gentlemen on the jetty taking various decisions, there was no central authority who would say, overrule everybody and take stock of the situation and give the necessary executive orders. The exact figures will never be known, but these figures which I'm quoting are from the Enquiry Commission till 731 injured approximately 2048. Material losses, Victoria Dock completely damaged, Princess Dock partially damaged, Alexander Dock luckily unaffected. The 300 acres of area around the Victoria Dock suffered heavy collateral damage. 10 of the 26, 26 ships which were Within Victoria and Princess Dock had to be sold as scrap. Total tonnage lost 34,639. Compensation paid by the government because of the accident. I'm giving the figures here. Dumping of debris. The, the amount of debris which was accumulated in the docks and the contiguous area were huge. 350 trucks made four trips over six months carrying debris from Victoria Dock here to Hebandar and these dumping points north and south of the Sivri Food. This is the total area which uh, debris was dumped. And as per the Bombay Salvage Group, Bombay Salvage Team report, 800,000 tons of debris were strewn around this area. I'm not going to go into the reconstruction of the, uh, of the portals because that's a separate uh, chapter by itself. But the whole reconstruction was given to the army and within six months, the Victoria Dock was put back into action and within one year, whatever was destroyed in the area around PWO Road was reconstructed. The Vice President of the Bombay Chamber of Commerce said it all. This is what the people of Bombay did, you know, the, this we have the spirit of Bombay and when uh, the government doesn't rise to the occasion, it is the common man which rises to the occasion. There are many stories about it. I'm only going to narrate four of them. Mr. Ali Mohammed Beklai, he was a businessman and he was also the treasurer of the Chemist Association of Bombay. He hired a taxi when, when he heard about this he, uh, explosion and he saw it. He realized that hospitals would run short of medicines. So he hired a taxi, went around all chemist shops in, Bom in South Bombay. Most of these chemist shops gave him medicines at cost price or gratis. He collected all this medicine and went to JJ Hospital and handed over to the hospital authorities. He insisted that the taxi driver would paid his fare. He refused. The taxi driver refused, but on, when Muhammad Ali Meklai insisted on it, he took the money, went to the nearest chemist, 
bought some medicines and handed over to the hospital. And this was not restricted to Indian nationals. Four American women whose names are on the screen were part of the American Red Cross. When they knew about this accident, they took the Red Cross vehicle carrying refreshments for people who were firefighting inside the Victoria Dock. They drove right through the dock, set up that stall between two warehouses, one containing cotton, the other containing uh, uh, acid, set up that table until the last firefighting person was served refreshments, refused to leave the station. Fahid Bakshi was an Indian Army Ordnance Corps uh, Army guy. He and his team who were involved in salvaging things in the Victoria Dock entered a warehouse where acid, acid bottles were broken. There were about 150 acid bottles kept in that warehouse. Four of his, with four of his uh, team, he removed the entire acid bottles from that warehouse to a safe place. And this, of course, is my favorite story of the Bombay Dock explosion. Mr. Motiwala was a retired engineer from Bombay, from Bombay Dying, who stayed at Gir who, who was staying in Girgam. When the first explosion uh, took place, he told his family to get to get out from the building and come on to the main road up. And when the second explosion took place, he saw a big slab. Of he thought it was a stone or a metal piece falling in the falling in the balcony. And it was he didn't want that stone to hang around there, so he went up to the went up to this flat which was on the third floor, picked up the slab. It actually happened to be a gold bar, which had a number Z one three two five six. When he saw this gold bar, 28 pounds, about 12 kgs, he knew this would have been, this would have come from the ship. He walked up to the police commissioner's office, which was across his house in uh, profit market, and handed over this gold bar to the police authorities. Impressed by the honesty on display, the police authorities said they would recommend an award for him. Mr. Motiwala promptly said, whatever amount he gets, 50% of that, he will give it to the relief, uh, to the relief fund which would be set up by the government. This gold bar was then valued at 90,000 pounds. Sorry, 90,000, uh, rupees 90,000. Mr. Motiwala did get his reward from the government, which was about 1% of the amount. And which amounted to 999 rupees. Now remember, 90,000 rupees in today's value would be about four and a half crores, and 999 rupees would be about 4.5 lakhs. It was a huge amount. And when this money came, Mr. Motiwala changed his mind. Instead of giving only 50% of the reward, he donated the entire amount to the relief fund, which was set up by the government. The story of the Bombay Dock explosion would never be complete if I didn't pay my tribute to the firefighting to the firefighters. It was true that there were errors of judgment made, and at a crucial time, the uh, gas cutting machine did not work. But these gentlemen, you know, once the, the fire raged for about three days, and you know, when the fire was not brought under control in the Victoria Dock, they were deployed in the, uh, on Muhammad Ali Road, which is then called Sidanam Road. They formed a fire wall between the western part of Muhammad Ali Road and eastern part of Muhammad Ali Road, and they ensured that the fire never spread beyond Muhammad Ali Road. The, the gentleman you see in the photograph was Mr. Merwanji, who was part of the Bombay Auxiliary Fire Service, joined it at the age of 17, later on became the chief fire officer for the Bombay Fire Brigade, and Mr. Norman Coombs, who was then the chief fire officer of the Bombay Fire Brigade. In the photograph below are these gentlemen in 1978, 
when Mehrwanji was the chief fire officer and Mr. Norman Coombs, Norman Coombs visited the Bombay Fire Brigade. The fire tender you see, which is still preserved and kept in the headquarters of the Bombay, Bombay Fire Brigade, is the one which was used in the dock explosion. Mr. Rustam Palamkot, he was the first Parsi to head a fire station in Bombay, and he was in charge of the fourth fire station. He personally led his team in firefighting, and when the second explosion took place, he succumbed to it. His entire torso was ripped open, and they could recognize that body only because of the buttons. You know, because being, the, being an officer, his, the buttons were slightly different, and this was the only way they recognized that, the body. These buttons are in the position of the family of Mr. Palamkot, and uh, this came to me courtesy Mr. Zamir Palamkot, who is his grandson. This is the felicitation given by the city of Bombay to Mr. Palamkot's the late Palamco, this is his son here, receiving a plaque from the municipal commissioner. And his younger brother, Mr. Adel Palamco, is the younger brother of uh, Mr. Rustam Palamco. He was also a fire officer. These are two memorials to the fire, uh, to the firefighting, uh, to the Bombay Fire Brigade. The, the one on the left is a Daikala which was set up in 1946. The one on the right it was set up in 1971 at the Bombay Post. 14th, in, from 1971, 14th April has been now um, celebrated as National Fire Service Day in memory of all those firefighters who gave up their lives on 14th April 1944. This is the present state of Princess Victoria Dock. This is Princess Dock, this is Victoria Dock, both filled up. And this building here is the port office, uh, is the uh, port office of the Victoria and Princess Dock, which is still intact. And this is the time wall, which is atop this building. This paper would have never been, uh, uh, would, would have never seen the light of the day if so many people as listed on the slide have helped me. Thank you, Commander. That was very fascinating. Uh, 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 it was almost like we were actually there. For me personally, the, the heartwarming stories which you talked about at the end, the four people, the taxi driver, the chemist shop story, the ladies of the Red Cross, and of course, the often repeated story about the past the highlights. But I want to begin with questions from somebody of your fraternity. Uh, yet another retired uh, uh, veteran of the Navy has asked these two questions. What was the fire protection uh, uh, system on the stick in and could it, could it not have averted or at least reduced the scope of the disaster? And the second one is related. Uh, is it likely that the cotton would have been ignited due to electromagnetic radiation? What was the fire protection system on the stick-in which could have reduced the scope of the disaster? Okay. And the second one... I'll answer the it, first one. You know, all right. Uh, there was no sprinkler system. I, I know this is coming from a naval officer, so I know what he's getting at. There was no sprinkler system in 1944. There was no pre-wetting. There was no sprinkler system. What they had was just, uh, you had the normal fire extinguishers for oil fires and electrical fires and general fires. There was no pre wetting system, there was no sprinkler system. The sprinkler system did exist, but it was confined to the engine rooms. It was not existing in the holds. The second question? The second one was like this. Is it possible that the cotton which was stored in the ship could have been ignited due to electromagnetic radiation, possibly from other signals, etc. You know, there's nothing left of the stiking to do a forensic examination. Uh, it could not have been electromagnetic uh, radiation because 
you know the way the things were packed you had you had you had lubricating oil you had cotton you had ammunition all mixed together what the commission of inquiry actually it was circumstantial evidence what they uh, what they decided was it could be an accidental fire either because cotton was combustible you know it could be combustible it could be a pot fire by itself because the the temperature that day was 44 degrees the ambient temperature was 44 degrees or it could be a cigarette left behind by one of the stewards but there was nothing left of the staking to do a forensic examination which brings me to our next question somebody wanted to know how was all this documented and how was all this information made available and related to that is another question by somebody else if you want to read up more about this where can you find it uh, the documentation was when the uh, uh, when the order for abandoning ship was given the second officer you know he had he uh, the captain told him to take the entire documents of the ship which also included the ship's log and give it to the agent of the ship now the ship's log was available to the commission of inquiry for uh, coming to their uh, conclusions and they examined 259 witnesses you know so all the evidence which was available was from circumstantial evidence there was no the, the main people who fought the fire the captain of the ship the, the chief officer everybody perished in it uh huh they found was only circumstantial evidence and statements of witnesses okay. there's just one book at least in, in english there's just one book by john ennis an american who wrote on the bombay dock explosion and that came out in 1959 i have not come across any reference in the vernacular on this although people have told me it exists but the the primary source for this is the commission of inquiry report it came out in two parts mm -hmm. that is what will give you the uh, that that is the primary source for this great uh, would you say commander that this is one of the biggest ever naval disasters maybe in india maybe in asia no it's it's not a naval disaster it's a maritime disaster I, i'm sorry i'm sorry i meant the maritime you know, big difference it, yes it, it was the it was the biggest maritime disaster in india but surprisingly 15 days after what happened in bombay a similar thing happened in a german port which was uh -huh. massive than what happened in bombay but as far as we are concerned the biggest maritime disaster in india was the bombay dock explosion mm -hmm. we have a very personal uh, comment from somebody who's in the audience her name is nazni hamza and she says her father sheikh abdul qadir mohammad jafar was the assistant general manager at that time she's not specified in what service and he received the commendation for uh, brave conduct by viceroy bebo and she wants to know where she can find more information about his role on, in the event so well, the, the uh, company of inquiry is uh, but I, you know uh, you know I, i'll tell you this story when i went to the bombay port because i thought this commission i had read john ennis's book i couldn't go by one uh, reference i went to the bombay port because i thought they will have this commission of inquiry mm -hmm. the, the answer will surprise you you know uh -huh. the bombay audience they know they know marathi so when i asked them for you know whether they have this very helpful people they had no clue of it you know it must be lying somewhere in some cupboard of some official in the port trust they didn't have the commission of inquiry mm -hmm. and, a lot sorry but i got this from the archives of the raj bhavan okay. but that but unless the lady tells me which office it is i will have no idea because people who were examined and who were rewarded everything is there in the commission of inquiry report but i have not come across this name in the commission of inquiry report sure so now as if you can type your uh, response uh, 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 she says he was a she was a he was a manager in the bombay docks no uh, but um, uh, no that that's a, that's a very vague appointment uh, no okay. i i'm not I'm sorry, I am not coming. We can e-connect you guys later so that you she can directly get in touch with you. That's fine. Sorry, sorry for this, uh, Nazneen. Let's move on. 
Um, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 Arthur Reynolds. Yes. Taiwan wanted to know if, uh, if Reynolds Road in Badala, considering it's so close to the dock, Docklands, was named after this Arthur Reynolds. Uh, Arthur Reynolds was a British officer. Mm -hmm. officer was on like Bowman Coombs, he, he was on deputation to the Bombay Fire Brigade. But no, I, 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 I don't, I don't uh, have any idea about the connection. Okay. But he perished. He, uh, he, he perished in the dock explosion. Okay. Uh, going back to the root cause, there was a question, as you, as you know, about the, the cotton. There was another one about uh, the code two telephone call. Yes. Uh, which could have alerted everybody about the hazardous car cargo. Yes. Uh, Pradeep wanted to know how you came by this information about code two. I guess the answer is uh, the, the, the inquiry commission. commission, the commission but, uh, inquiry, uh, it is there in the inquiry commission report is also there in John Ennis's book. Mm -hmm. But the primary source, if anybody wants to know about it, the primary source is the commission of inquiry report. And I will, it's a very interesting uh, story to this. The first mm -hmm. commission of inquiry was published on 19th of September, it was presented to the trustees of the board, uh, it was presented to the trustees of the Bombay Port Trust. But one week before that, on 12th of September, the Free Press Journal published the entire part one of the commission report in its paper. And if you go to the Free Press archive, you'll get this. The entire, it, was, it was leaked to the Free Press. Nobody knows how it was leaked. Even before the trustees, the, the commission inquiry, the report was placed before the trustees on 19th of September at the meeting. But 12th September, Free Press published it. The Times of India published the second report, but that was a truncated uh, uh, report. It didn't have the entire report. Somewhere in mid December 1944. Okay. But, but the commission of inquiry report is available. That's the primary source. Okay. There's a personal story which has tumbled out. Some uh, Pradeep's father was with the Bombay Customs and, and he was in the docks at the time of the explosion. And he said that he was saved by getting under a table which was close to him. So he's really grateful for helping him reconstruct the event. I also have a similar story. My mother was a young girl at that time and she, they lived at Kairwa Street. And she remembers being uh, not allowed to go outdoors for about three days after the explosion. It's possible. Because the fire, the, the collateral damage which was caused by the explosion, especially in the areas surrounding the port trust, was mm -hmm. and that is where the fire, the firefighters came in. They didn't do much inside the dock, but what happened outside the dock when they formed this firewall on Muhammad Ali Road and prevented the fire from spreading westwards from Muhammad Ali Road. That is what actually what saved Bombay. Um. Chandrasekhar Nene wanted to know what was the exact weight of the gold and was it all recovered and can you see some of it in any museum? No, this is the this mm -hmm. is because uh, on 22nd April, the Bombay Chronicle published that all gold was recovered. You have to take it with a huge dose of mm -hmm. because you still hear stories, you know, of family in and around Princess Street, Girgaon. You know, I heard many stories, nothing corroborated, that uh, they, they have this bar of gold. And I know a, sorry, I know a local historian who wants to go, go trolling in the dock uh, and deep sea diving to find them. And very, very, there's, a, there's a lot of ambiguity about this gold thing because the Commission of Inquiry called upon 259 witnesses. They didn't spare anybody. All the big bits of the port first and maybe everybody was called, but not a single person was called from the RBI. Mm -hmm. no, the, 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 they were the consignees of the gold, but nobody was called from the RBI. In, in fact, this is the only drawback in the report. The whole report dismisses this gold thing in just one sentence. 31 crates of gold were embarked on the strike. That is the only thing which comes in the inquiry, Commission of Inquiry report. The rest of the information which I got from jo is from John Ennis's book, The Bombay Dock Explosion. So, uh, somebody had a question. Can you exactly give the name of this author? Can you repeat it for the purpose of, for the sake of Piyush Kaitan? John Ennis, J O H N John. Uh -huh. E double N I S. It's a book which was published in 1959 by Jayco. In fact, there were two editions. One was for the US, uh, US market, one was for the Indian market. And surprisingly, 
the Indian the Indian edition had more information than the US edition. This okay. is a member of the Asiatic Society, you will get it. But unfortunately, this book is out of print. Okay. Um, are there any records of deafness due to the high decibel noise sounds which this must have been created? Yeah, the, the, there's so, the people who, I mean, people, especially from the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Port Trust who perished. This, how many people died is a very, very vague thing because nobody knows the exact figure. The, the figure which is, the commission itself says, and even, you know, uh, where people suffered from, uh, you know, deafness, etc., because of the explosion, no. There, there is no record of that. In the, they, they come, the commission didn't go, didn't go into it. Isa had a question. Is it correct that one of the clock towers in the dock still shows the time of the explosion? Yes. You know, uh, uh, when the first explosion took place at 4-6, you know, uh, the, 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 the Ghariyal Godi, which is on the uh, Act Princess dock, the minute hand was stuck at 6. And that, that, was, a, that was a great piece of evidence that the first explosion took place at 4-6. The second explosion took place 34 minutes later at 4.40. So that is the evidence. Okay. Uh, a small technical question from somebody. What exactly does a dry dock, uh, the, uh, uh, does a wet dock mean? Is it where no repairs take place as in a dry dock? Uh, a wet dock is, no, there are two, two kinds of dock. One is a dry dock, one is a wet dock. The wet dock is whether, you know, when it has water, it has jetty and the ship comes and ties up at the gym. That is what a wet dock is. A dry dock is, which basically used for repairs. You know, when you the, the, the part which is under which is under the water has to be repaired periodically. So the dry dock is, you know, where ships are repaired. There is no water in it. You know, this is a technical thing. You know, uh, wet dock is what you see in a in the port trust. Uh, last question. Uh, this, the querist was commenting that Princess Dock and Victoria Dock are no more. How much of their disbanding or use as a dock had to do with this explosion? Nothing to do with the explosion. Well, the explosion happened in 1944. Mm -hmm. Victoria Dock and the Princess Dock were covered up as late as uh, 2000, between 2009 and 2011. The two things are unrelated. Why it was uh, filled up as for totally different reasons.